G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. We're going to have The Outsiders followed by First Dog on the Moon, who has made a return after a three week absence. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. Yes, indeedy. Thank you, Uncle Barry. Outsiders time it is at 20 to 10. This morning you're joined in Canberra by Mark Fletcher. He's a blogger and occasional contributor to New Matilda. In Sydney, Bridie Jabour writes for Guardian Australia. Also there, writer and journalist Nick Cater. Welcome to you all. Hello. Hello. Oh, how reassuring. There are voices. <laughs> it's always a good moment to hear them come back. Now, one of the big things this week was was a, a really interesting speech uh, by Rupert Murdoch. He was in the country, a, a, a moment that normally just energises a handful of newspaper editors and their staff who suddenly start to look anxious and looking for pet stories in their papers. But it's a bit broader in its implications this time, as, as Mr Murdoch is becoming more of the, the media statesman as much as mogul. He gave a big speech at the Lowy Institute, and he called for this country to, to seize its place in the world of the coming century. Here's just a fragment of that speech. All around us, we face something this region has never had before. A wealthy, educated, globally competitive middle class of more than two billion people. Let's stop thinking about Australia's place in the world as defined by its alliances, by its trading partners, by its government. Yes, we will fight regulations that hamper growth and economic development. But it's the Australian people who collectively define this nation's destiny. And, and Nick Cato, he went on with a, a really interesting idea that Australia should become a disruptive economy. Yeah, I like that. I've not heard that discussion before, but I do like the sound of it. You know, the, the idea that, that every now and then, we've seen it so often recently, that the uh, economies can be disrupted, the capitalist you know, free market system suddenly gets this great disruptive moment. And, and the idea that we should actually be the disruptors instead of sort of trying to cope with disruptions that come upon us, I thought it was a really great idea. I, I would like to think about that a, a bit further. But I did like, the, you know, definitely this return to the idea that we've nothing to be uh, we're troubled about in this country. We are a tremendously successful country and we can continue to be if we use what, you know, Rupert Murdoch called our greatest renewable resource, which is our people. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing. I mean, there's all sorts of strands in this, <coughs> Mark Fletcher, I mean, nothing to fear and, and, and a, a, a country and economy with considerable advantages and possibilities. And yet, through the, the very media that Mr Murdoch produces, for example, we often get a quite contrary impression. Can, yeah. we, can we sort of shake this off? Well, look, I'm in my 20s, and so for the entirety of my life, Rupert Murdoch has been the big media mogul. It turns out, and this is something I didn't know before sort of reading this up, was that for the entire duration of my parents' lives as well, he's been the media mogul. For him to say sort of like... He's he, always been there, Mark, and always He's will. always been there, basically. And for this, for this guy to say, hey, let's have this disruptive moment, I don't think he quite realises that everybody's trying to disrupt against him. Um, so if he's, if he's reading his own papers, he'd sort of see that he is the, you know, the big fear, uh, harbinger of fear. Uh, and, and he's not, I sort of wonder if this is something to do with sort of his life over the last sort of 12 months. He's just had a new kid, he's had a very public divorce with his wife, and he sort of looks back on this and goes, where's my place in all of this situation? Where's my place in the world? And he still sees himself as the rebel against the BBC and against the ABC, which is strange. It's like, what's actually going on in the mind of this very, very powerful guy? And yet, Brady, he's, he's right about the country, is he not? I mean, it's, the sense of our possibility is extraordinary, and yet, and yet it's an elusive thing. And, and when you look at some of the, the debates contemporaneously this week, uh, with, with Murdoch talking about being a disruptive economy, at the same time we have this other discussion about continuing to pour billions of dollars into a moribund auto industry. We're, we're kind of not quite getting the point. Well, I, I thought the idea of a disruptive economy was really interesting, but I would have liked him to go into more detail about how we could be a disruptive economy. In almost every article you read about it, it was um, Rupert calls for a disruptive economy, but no, nothing explained how, and I don't think that his speech explained how either. But I think it's 
definitely hitting the nail on the head that Australia is still trying to find its feet on the global stage and its place on the global stage. And we we are quite an important country, and we're, it's un, like very unruly <coughs> what we've done in the past few years. But I think that Australia can be a bit insecure as well, and I think that he captured that quite well. But I would have liked to have known how we can disrupt, disrupt the global economy. And one of the other phrases, uh, Nick, that really caught my eye was that, the, that, that Australia is an egalitarian meritocracy. Mm. I thought that was that was elegant. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean I'm, as you know, I mean, my, my book uh, looks a lot at egalitarianism, and I've, I've examined this topic. I, I, I think it's your terminology, because I'm not sure I would have put quite meritocracy together with egalitarianism, but that's a, another debate. But I think, you know, to go to Mark's point about what's, you know, unravelling the great enigma of, of Rupert Murdoch, I think the key to Rupert Murdoch is not really what's happened in the last t year of his life, but his family's history. I mean, he's a, you know, the key thing to, about Rupert Murdoch is he's a Presbyterian, or comes from that background, the Calvinist worker, your own salvation background. That was his grandfather was actually a, a church minister, and mm. this is very much, you know, the sort of spirit that drove this country. I and mean, you see how many Scottish people, his, his Scottish family, have had trem been tremendously successful because of this work ethic and and uh, and, uh, and focus they bring and I think that's the key to understanding Rupert and the key to sort of interpreting this speech because what he's saying is that migrants like his family was what you know four generations back uh, are really the key to this country because you come and you work you know I think that's that's, that's a romantic no, way to put no, that's well, a very romantic way to describe a guy who said I want to fill a newspaper with a word that I'm not sure I'm allowed to say on radio like he destroyed standards of that of papers in the UK and destroy standards out here as well all in the the spirit of this sort of you know business entrepreneurial anti-elitist which is a strange phrase for him to use uh, and, and you say oh this is just his presbyterian work ethic that's a joke well you know, I, mean, I don't know how much you've read about rupert murdoch's back background or, or read about the presbyterian contribution to this this country mark um when you have perhaps you'd understand this a bit better the, the Bridie, the, the, there's a point in there, uh, the, the, the paradox of Murdoch, isn't it, that, that he has, yes, this, this sense of great possibilities, an extraordinary figure. I mean, the, the, the man has created a remarkable thing in his lifetime, and yet there's a, often a, a, a fairly negative influence of the things that he has created. How do we sort of reconcile those two things? Well, I don't know that we can love him or hate him. I think that everyone can recognise that he's pretty much a once-in-a-generation mind, especially when it comes to business and when it comes to media. But he is a ball of contradictions, but what human being, I guess, isn't. He, rail he rails against the elite in one breath, and the next breath says that we should be only allowing immigrants in who are university educated. And I think that the ball of contradictions that he wrestles with, I guess the rest of us wrestle with as well. And I, I think your views of him obviously come from, probably from your political stance as well. Oh, could I just interrupt there? I mean, I, yes, I can't let this line go that it's, it's a, you know, the, the idea that he's a, a, a predominantly negative force. I mean, that just flies in the face of what he and his family have achieved in the last 100 years. They've made a tremendously positive contribution to public life in this country you know let's let but that goes to Brady's comment which is it depends on your politics no, no it does not it, it, it is it, it does it, 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 oh, wait a minute wait oh, a hang minute. on it's a, Nick, sorry, it's, sorry. can i finish can i finish it's a, it it's a it's a measurably positive contribution if you look at the size of his business the amount that that has contributed to this economy and then if you look at his contribution to public life by having the the, the guts to set up a paper like the Australian in 1964, when there was no national broadsheet paper, you know, mm. investing in that, risking his own money, and 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 sticking with it for 49 years now, um, and you know, I mean, I know the Australian's got its critics, but I mean, I I, I challenge anybody to say that just overwhelming contribution to Australian public life over 49 years has been negative. I'd like to hear that case made because I I think it's very you know very difficult to do so. I think the problem in Australia is the lack of diversity in the media, and I think that the influence does become negative when we're just hearing from one side i think we have if we had more diversity in newspapers then the perception wouldn't be so negative about his influence in australia and i think the influence of his newspapers in australia is a little bit overreaching and goes a little bit further than it should i it's think that's right but i mean i don't know that you can necessarily blame the successful player in the market for the fact that others can't get in i mean yes you know of course we need we need more diversity of, of course you know it, it's a tragedy to see Fairfax, uh, you know, struggling the way it is. For all of us who've been in journalism and love journalism, that's a tragedy. But I, I don't know that you can blame the guy who's, do, you know, actually trying to keep his head above water for, for what's happening in the rest of the industry. There's every chance we may not get to the bottom of the Murdoch enigma in the time available to us. So we'll, 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 we'll move on gracefully to Western Australia, where 
Of course, stuff has been happening. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've certainly been vindicated in the uh, in our call for a recount. Uh, quite a few hundred votes have changed hands. I'm oh, obviously very excited about the, the result. Obviously, there's uh, still some more things to be worked through for the uh, AC and, and that, so obviously very excited, but uh, we'll still, still wait and see what's going to happen. Now, that's that household name, Wayne Dropulik from the Australian Sports Party, and before that, Green Senator, as he may well be, Scott Ludlam, who both secured WA Senate spots on Saturday after that rather controversial recount and loss of votes. It looks, Nick Cater, like we will have, uh, almost certainly, a fresh election in WA. What do you think that will mean for the likes of the Australia Sports Party? Will, will, will voters in Western Australia uh, perhaps approach this ballot differently, given the rather interesting results that we've seen in the Senate? I mean, my, my sense, because it's only a sense, you never, know, you never predict these things, but I would, I would think that people will coalesce, uh, you know, back towards the big parties. I don't think that, you know, there'll still be a large uh, diversity of votes around there. Uh, but, yeah, you know, it's, I, the, the fact, it, it's a very, very unfortunate thing to have happened. Uh, it's very hard to sort of apportion blame on this. Mm. The Australian Election Commission is, it does an amazing job every three years to wind up and conduct this tremendous operation and, and, and it's not their fault that the ballot papers are as complicated as they are you know that's parliament's fault and parliament has to address this one clearly by 2016 and uh, you know i feel sorry for the people of western australia having to go to well, the polls it, again it, but that's a civic it, it, it may well be their fault that they lost 1375 of them <laughs> <laughs> well, i mean how many votes were cast in all i don't know 10 million yes. it's probably not a bad record <laughs> but mark, mark does this does this cast something of a poll uh, I'm a conservative, so I'm slightly biased in the whole thing. Uh, but it does sort of lend to that impression that a lot of us are getting that the Senate is basically like a lottery, where you you can basically work out who the top four seats are going to go to, but those fifth and sixth seats, you really have no idea of which way those ones are going to go. I wonder if we can look at our Senate still and sort of see a legitimate system. Uh, this is a debate that's been raging since Federation Sir Isaac Isaacs mm. uh, said that the Senate's a waste of time and how dare we have this system that is fundamentally undemocratic. Uh, I wonder if we're starting to see maybe the legitimacy of the Senate being questioned a bit more, which would be good. Unrepresentative swill, of course, Bridie, according to a former PM. I guess this, this coming election will give the people of Western Australia at least the opportunity for something of a verdict on whether they like that fragmentation or whether they want to stick with a more two-party kind of setup. I think that it will make people consider their vote more because with the, su the success of the Parler Party that I, I really don't think many people saw coming, I certainly didn't see that coming, but my feeling was that a lot of people voted for him as a bit of a, a, bit of a joke, a bit of a laugh, and I think that they've seen how successful he is, and we don't mm. really know what he stands for, do we? Like, he's, he's not... Like, what's his ideology? What does he want to achieve in Parliament except maybe to be disruptive? His policies are really outlandish and just cannot be funded. You can say the same things about the Greens, but at least you know the Greens' ideology. So I think that this will make people consider their vote more. And just going back to Mark's point about the Senate, Queensland doesn't have a Senate, and look how well things are going for them up there. Good point. Oh, Good point. I definitely... <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And, and just quickly, Nick, on that, that issue of Clive Palmer, I mean, the, the, the idea of, of conflict of interest is raising its head fairly conspicuously in his case. Can you get away with this line continually that, well, that's none of your business, that's my personal affairs? Well, no, no, I think this is, if I was, you know, a full-time investigative journalist, I think this would be the case I'm looking at. Look, no, you know, plainly he can't. I mean, it, it, it's a novelty in politics. He's, he's got a message there, which actually people in small business quite like, uh, and, and, and other things have, have happened to give him this, this election result, but he has to now deliver, and he can't be seen to be. You know, the, under the scrutiny that you get in Parliament, I think he's going to have to uh, be prepared to, uh, to take the hit. We're going to see a lot of him. That much is entirely certain in this term. And uh, I'll pull out, pull out. Look, thanks to all of you for a, a lively chat this morning. Um, Always a pleasure. <laughs> your, your outsiders today have been Mark Fletcher. He's a, a blogger, New Matilda contributor and conservative. Uh, Bridie Jabor, who writes for Guardian Australia, a writer and journalist. And an interesting critique from Nick Cater this week on the Australian journalistic scene in the Weekend Australian. I recommend it to you. Nick Cato, our other guest. That has been Outsiders. It's six minutes away from 10 o'clock.
patriots. Welcome to First Dog on the Moon's Guide to Modern Living. I'm Walkley Award-winning cartoonist, First Dog on the Moon. Clive Palmer's in Parliament, the Australian Electoral Commissioner in disarray, democracy is in tatters. 1,375 missing votes, it's a disgrace and a shambles. Remember when they lost all those votes in Indi? No, neither do I. That was before Tony was Prime Minister and we've always been at war with Oceania. I do remember laughing and laughing, but I can't quite recall why it was. Right now, out in the always sunny west where everyone's listening to Radio National huddled round a crystal set with a wire up a frangipani, hello Perth, maybe Clive Palmer is right when he says the Australian Electoral Commission is compromised, corrupt and even on the nod on the 96 tram. Maybe he's right when he says the AEC shares a moon base with the CIA. It does seem odd that the Australian Electoral Commission has been having trouble doing the simplest thing, counting votes and then putting them in a box. You see, you don't just have to count the votes, you have to put them in the box or basket or other vote-shaped container afterward because, and this is not complicated, but pay attention, you have to hang on to them just in case you need to count them again. It's called a recount. And while it's a very technical term, I don't expect you to understand it, it's the only thing the ASC has to do, and they seem to have buggered it up. Except in Fairfax, just ask Clive. To be fair, there are millions of votes. There's supposed to be one for every Australian over 18, and the margin for error is considerable, even if they get the count right, because every Australian over 18 is allowed to vote. But what if the people of WA wanted, say, Gwendolyn Headcrab of the Australian Teeny Tiny Party to go to Canberra and give those fat cats for a what for? Or did they? Perhaps they wanted that nice young Senator Follicle back in the nation's capital, the one with all those lovely shirts. Or maybe they wanted one of the other weirdos or factional hacks who were lining up to motivate the cleavage of taxpayer-funded largesse over in that giant political food trough the rest of us know as Canberra. Now, we'll never know. The AEC lost 1,375 votes. Not two, not even 74, which is about as many West Australian Senate ballots you could shove down your dax without giving yourself a nasty paper cut on the Scott Morrison. 1,375. They were in the middle of a recount, lost a Clive load of ballots, and then they declared it anyway. For the Greens. <coughs> now that seems a bit sus. I smell a rat. That's right. The delicious smelling native rat, or bush rat, Ratus fuscopis, is a small Australian nocturnal omnivore. It's one of the most common species of rats and is found in many heathland areas of Victoria and New South Wales. Unlike other ratus species, it's characterised by having a small tympanic bullae and a straight incisive foramina. Adult bush rats are smaller than the Australian swamp rat, Ratus lutriolus, and in addition, the bush rat's footpads are a pink colour, whereas the swamp rat's footpads are dark brown. Adorable. And... Squeak, squeak. They smell fantastic. It's the only thing that gets me through having to watch democracy trampled underfoot by these idiots. Anyway, me and the rat are off to the court of disputed returns, and how much fun is that going to be? Not at all. This has been First Dog on the Moon's Guide to Modern Living, proudly brought to you by the First Dog on the Moon Institute. Squeak, squeak, squeak. There you go. I'm delighted to be able to bring you the return of First Dog on the Moon. Warbles on at the YouTube. And thank you to the wildlife who uh, cooperated greatly during the filming of this. Ciao!